Aloha everyone, it's Randy Rarick, your host for this year's Hawaiian Island Vintage Surf Auction brought to you by Quicksilver. As many of you know, we produce this auction every other year and once again we're back to the Blaisdell Center to present a hundred years worth of classic surf memorabilia. What we want to do is give you a little sneak preview of what you're going to see this year. Well, as I said, we basically cover nearly a hundred years worth of surfing history and starting off at the very beginning, from the 1800s, we have a classic example of probably one of the most unique Elia boards that I've ever seen. Most of the Elias are usually in the range in the five to six foot, seven foot at most range. This is actually a nine foot version of it. And as you can see, it has a long pulled out tail. And this is the board that the Hawaiians made. This is made out of breadfruit or ulu wood. And it's very unique in that it's all one piece of wood. And you can see a little bit of repair, a little bit of termite damage up on the top, a little butterfly patch. And uh, this will be a, uh, a really rare offering to have a board from the 1800s made out of one single piece of wood. So moving on in our timeline, what's really interesting from the Elia boards that were made of a solid piece of tree came the plank boards. Now the plank boards are basically in the late 1800s, early teens, they began to import uh, redwood and cedar from the U.S. mainland for construction projects. So this board was made and then ridden in Waikiki and, it and really represents a great uh, air for the, the plank boards. And this is the size of the plank pretty much dictated the shape of the board and this is a really good representation of a 1920s redwood plank board. Well moving on in our timeline of uh, sort of the history of surfboards that will be presented at the Hawaiian Island Vintage Surf Auction. We've seen the turn of the century boards, the plank boards of the 20s. Now we're moving into the 30s. What made the 30s unique is they discovered waterproof glue. This allowed them to glue different types of wood together and you can see here the different types of laminations. We've got redwood pine, redwood pine and that was a, usually the, the wood of choice, also balsa wood was used, and they would glue it together and the waterproof glue held it together. Another unique aspect of this, you can see the nose is kicked up, and this is what's known as a steam nose. What they did is they steamed the wood and they were able to bend the wood and create rocker because the wood came into straight plank sheets and this allowed them to create a little bit of kick so they wouldn't purl. So a nice good example of a small but classic 1930s wood board. After World War II, the advent of resin and fiberglass changed everything. They finally figured out that you could cover the board, waterproof it, and with that they could go to lighter material. So in the early 50s, the wood of choice became balsa wood. Now balsa boards during the 50s became very prevalent. Everybody was making them. This is a classic example of a Hobie balsa, Del Velzi, and then Hap Jacobs. Joe Quigg, Matt Kivlin, a variety of, of manufacturers and shapers specialized in balsa. And the first foam boards came out in about 1958 and by 1960 foam became the medium of choice. This is a classic Dale Velzi shaped foam surfboard with a three quarter inch redwood stringer. And what makes this board unique, it actually was used as a prop board for the Gidget series of movies that Hollywood came out in the early 60s. Gidget really opened up the whole nature of surfing, exposed surfing to the masses across America, and with the first Gidget movie came a series of terribly B-grade movies, but it was great. And this is actually a prop board from one of the Gidget films, shaped by Del Velzi, the master shaper in the early 60s. This board probably came out in about 1960 and utilized to surf and also then utilized in the movie. And it represents really the whole essence of what the early 60s were all about with foam boards and it really blew out the whole it exploded surfing across America and around the world. And we have a number of 60s boards and this is just a, a good representation of a classic early 60s foam board. Well with the golden era of the 60s evolving to the latter part of the 60s, the cultural revolution took over and also what's known as the short board revolution came on. This is when boards went from 9 to 10 foot, began to drop in length down to eight foot and then they went shorter than that. This is a classic example of what's known as a mini gun. They went from a big wave gun to a mini gun where the boards went down to about eight foot and they got really radical. You can see the pointed tail on this one, the wild colors on it. It kind of, as a drug and the cultural revolution took hold, so did the shortboard revolution. They sort of dovetailed with each other. And this really made a classic exchange as boards went from long to short. No longer were long boards passe they were gone. It, was, it had to be short and then they went even shorter. And probably one of the classic examples of the 70s was the fish. This is designed by a San Diego shaper named Steve Liss. And this is actually a knee board, but you can see the dual fins on the bottom. The twin fins called a fish design because of the cutaway on the tail. And this became really the flashpoint for short boards in the early 70s. And no better equipment in the 70s 
than a Dick Brewer gun. Dick Brewer was probably one of the most prolific shapers of the 70s and still to this day. And he's the one that designed what is, was, became known as the modern North Shore gun. This is a classic mid-70s example of a Dick Brewer gun. You can see how long it is, sleek, narrow. And this is the board that everybody rode on the North Shore in the 70s and still to this day. Moving on into the middle 70s, probably the most progressive design that came out of the mid 70s was known as the Stinger. What this was was a cutaway design on the tail and you can see down here how the, ch the rail line is cut away and changes. And then also on the tail is what's known as a swallowtail cutaway. And then this was attributed to Ben Ipa, Larry Bertelman, Buttons Kaluhio Kalani, Michael Ho, and a number of other surfers rode these in the early mid 70s. And these became the boards that everybody wanted to ride. And this is a great example of a Ben Ipa Stinger, which was really popular in the mid 70s. Well, probably no other label during the 70s represented the iconic air than the Lightning Bolt. Lightning Bolt was the brand that Jerry Lopez pioneered and nearly every good surfer throughout the 70s, mid 70s into the late 70s, even into the early 80s, wanted to ride for Lightning Bolt. So we want to thank you for joining us for just this little taste of what you're going to see at this year's Hawaiian Line and Vintage Surf Auction brought to you by Quicksilver. The dates once again, July 17th and 18th at Honolulu at the Blaisdell Center. All the boards will be on display on the 17th. We have an antique roadshow type of appraisal that we'll be doing from noon to four on the 17th. On the 18th, the actual auction takes place. Besides surfboards, as I said, we have memorabilia like surf magazines, decals, stickers, posters, books, all kinds of uh, surf memorabilia. We also have a silent auction which you can come and take part in with lesser quality items and, and lower priced items. So it's something a little bit something for everybody. So once again, join us for the Hawaiian Island Vinci Surf Auction July 17th and 18th at the Blaisdell Center and you'll come see surfing laid out in front of you, a history of the last hundred years of surfing. On behalf of Quicksilver, I'm Randy Rarick, mahalo and see you at the Blaisdell.